Good afternoon, good evening, good morning to all of you from wherever you're joining us across the world. My name is Sitembile Mwamakamba. I'm the Director of Policy Research and Analysis at the Food, Agriculture and Natural Resources Policy Analysis Network, FANAPEN. I'd like to welcome you to the launch of the Accelerating the Impact of CGIAR Climate Research for Africa, ACA Initiative. This is a four day event series. Today is the official launch event where we'll witness the signing ceremony. This will be followed by three days of dialogue sessions that will focus its discussions on the three components of the project. ACA, not to be confused for Accra, is a new initiative that will enhance access to climate information services valid and validate climate smart agriculture technologies in Africa. The initiative is supported by a grant from the International Development Association of the World Bank and will support research and capacity building activities by the CGIAR and its partners. Most of us will be familiar with the African proverb, if you want to go far, if you want to go fast, go alone. But if you want to go far, go together. Today, the launch of the ACA initiative is a demonstration of the importance of partnerships. Partners participation will be key in ACA to make sure that the program really responds to local and regional needs. So the CGIR will not be going alone in this initiator. Please note that this event provides French live interpretation. To access the interpretation, you may click the link available on the C events platform session page. Select your preferred language and make sure to mute the original video and only listen through the interratio page. Should you be asked for a code, please enter AICCRA dash day one. To begin our event, I would like to invite our first speaker, Eugen Fochel, who is the Vice President for Sustainable Development at the World Bank. Eugen, over to you. Thank you very much, Tembi, and a very, very warm welcome to all of you who are listening in uh, to this very important call. This is an important four-day event for Africa and for agriculture research. So I hope you get a lot out of the conversations over the next few days. Let's be very clear. Food security remains a continuous massive challenge, not only in Africa, but around the world. During the past 15 months, in, into COVID, it became yet again in clear how far away we are from a food secure and a nutrition secure world. So we cannot at this point slow down in, in our focus on agriculture research worldwide and certainly not on the African continent. <clears throat> we have seen the numbers of people who go hungry double in just the last 12 months. And I'm afraid to say there will be another 100 million joining that group by the end of this year the way things are going. We're looking at 250, 300 million people who will not have access to healthy and nutritious food. Also, nutrition is an issue that we should never forget, right? We, we, I looked at the numbers recently. Globally, every second person on the planet has one form of malnutrition or another. Either hungry, nutrition, uh, vitamin deficient, micronutrient deficient, or obese. So huge amounts of work are needed for all of us globally and certainly on the African continent to move us forward on this. But this particular focus, uh, this particular event and this particular grant that we from the World Bank provided is really about helping those who suffer from climate change to better adapt, to build resilience, to reduce their risks. And to, of course, on top where it is possible and feasible to also help mitigate the impact uh, of climate change. So this is a very, very important piece of research. At the World Bank, we've been supporting agricultural research for more than 50 years. We are one of the largest funders globally uh, to this topic. This is to the CGIAR, the Consultative Group of International Agricultural Research, but also huge amounts to the, to the National Agriculture Research Centers. And as Tembi was saying, this is not only the CGIAR that's working here, this is in partnership with everybody in that space. And we are committed to continue to support this very important agenda. Um, so I look forward to hearing from you um, 
what it is that you have to offer, what we are putting on the table. One thing is for sure, we need to accelerate agricultural research because in this decade, changes are coming so fast and we are reaching tipping points that will have massive implications for food security on the continent. And of course, in other parts of the world, the floods, the droughts, um, even the locust crisis that we've been in, in the last one and a half years is climate related. So a lot, a lot of work is needed in that space. And that is what this grant is all about. And as you heard, Tembi is leading the, the fund plan, the food agricultural net, the network for policy research. So let us, let me say this as well, let us not forget the policy component. Whatever agriculture research develops, and comes up with, whether it's internationally or at the local level, if it's not implemented at the country level, at the local level, it is not good, right? So, and oftentimes it is bad policies that are, that are in between. So a part of important agricultural research is the policy component that the CGIR can also bring to bear, but also of course, uh, the, the local uh, institutions and groups that, that we're working with. So with that, I really look forward to hearing from you um, what's happening. Jean Lucas is going to speak next and will introduce a little bit what the essence and the content and the components of this program are. And I wish you all a successful four days and hopefully all of you stay safe and healthy in these crazy times. Uh, with this over to you, uh, Tembi, or to Juan Lucas. Thank you, Jürgen, uh, for those remarks and uh, for reminding us to stay safe even as we deliberate on um, food issues. Next, I would like to invite Juan Lucas Restrepo, who is the Director General of the Alliance of Biodiversity International and CIED at the CGIR. Juan Lucas, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you uh, so much, uh, Tenby. Uh, greetings to all present. Uh, as Jürgen said, this is an important uh, day. I'm very pleased to be here today at the official launch of the project Accelerating the Impact of CGIR Climate Research for Africa. Uh, and climate change is already affecting the livelihoods of millions of farmers around the world. We are experiencing an increase in the frequency and intensity of extreme weather events, as well as new patterns that are disrupting crop cycles. In many of the poorest regions of the world, including Africa, climate change will not only reduce crop yields and make key areas unsuitable for production altogether, but also increase the incidence of animal diseases leading to higher food prices, up to 84% according to the World Economic Forum, if we don't do anything. Higher temperatures may also affect the quality of food reducing the levels of zinc, iron, and protein in some crops, as well as disrupting pollination and natural pest controls and leading to greater soil degradation and groundwater loss. We have only, only nine years, nine harvest seasons to achieve, to achieve the UN Sustainable Development Goals. Ending all forms of malnutrition and doubling the agricultural productivity and incomes of small scale, scale producers will need to happen within planetary boundaries, so the rest of the goals are also met. We will not be able to feed the world in a sustainable way if we don't drastically slow the pace of climate change. Science and novel technologies alone will be insufficient to drive the systemic transformation needed to address climate change and nourish the world. They will need to be accompanied by the creation of transdisciplinary networks and the development of an enabling environment that enhances farmers' capacity to use innovations and drive this transformation. This is especially true in Africa where achieving food security is linked to addressing climate change. Improving the delivery of agroclimatic services and increased climate smart agriculture, CSA, Investment planning is part of the solution. This includes providing all adequate decision support tools for tailoring adaptation interventions and innovations, creating an enabling environment for regional climate information services and CSA promotion, increasing collaboration among regional institutions 
and ensuring adequate dissemination of climate research results across the region. This is a one of a kind project. At the Climate Action Summit held during the UN General Assembly meeting in September 2019, the World Bank committed to increase its support to CGIAR. As a first step, the World Bank pledged $60 million to CCAP's project accelerating impact for, of CGIAR climate research in Africa. Funding was channeled through the Bank's International Development Association, which has very strict parameters, and um, I can witness and testify that to approve the grants. The Bank team worked very closely with CCAFs and our uh, alliance team to ensure that the project met all the requirements. With the project up and running, we will now work to leverage our one CGIR capacity to enhance the delivery of CSA and climate information services in Africa. Our goal is to work with our partners to increase climate resilience of agriculture and food systems as a way to improve food security and reduce poverty in the region. Thank you, and back to you, Kenji. Thank you, Juan, for those remarks, and thank you for, for reminding us of the urgency of our actions to be able to address the sustainable development goals. We have nine harvest years, you said, so we need to work fast. At this point, I would like to welcome our next speaker, Simeon Ewi, who is the Regional Director for Sustainable Development for Africa at the World Bank. Simeon, over to you. Um, thank you, uh, uh, Tembi. Thank you also, uh, Juan Lucas and uh, Jorgen for setting the stage. Uh, let me uh, start by uh, emphasizing uh, the urgency of uh, scaling up innovation in Africa's agriculture and value uh, and food value chains. Uh, this relates to one of the most important commitments uh, to galvanize action to address food insecurity in the context of climate change in Sub-Saharan Africa. After a period of improved food security, the situation in Sub-Saharan Africa has worsened. COVID-19 has dramatically increased the number of people in food crisis. According to the World Food Program, in November 2020, there were 272 million people acutely uh, uh, food insecure in Africa. The pandemic has compound, compounded multiple existing crises and it is expected to have protracted impact with a number of acutely food insecure people continuing to rise in 2021 and 2022. But in reality, COVID-19 has only added to many other forces that were causing food security to rise even before the pandemic. The importance of climate change as a key driver of hunger and food insecurity cannot be overstated. Uh, in many parts of Africa, Long-term effects such as rising temperatures and changing precipitation levels, as well as short-term effects resulting from extreme weather events, are continuing to uh, to to the decline, uh, contribute to the decline in the per capita food production growth, and making it difficult to meet the growing food needs of a rapidly increasing population. At the same time, the potential to transform the food system in Africa is immense. The key uh, ingredients are there, land, labor, capital, and know-how. Transformation of the food system will not only drive growth and help safeguard food security, it will create enormous numbers of jobs, including for the youth who are just entering the job market. Today, I would like to highlight two specific areas of action. First, we need to better target public spending on agriculture. And second, we need to direct more resources to investments in climate smart agriculture research 
and innovations, as alluded to by Jorgen and Juan Lucas earlier. The accelerated impact of CGI Climate Research in Africa project, known as ICRA, being launched here today, financed by the International Development Association through the regional IDA window, will help advance these vital agendas. First, government and their development partners need to reorient, optimize their and optimize their agricultural spending. Worldwide, governments spend around 600 billion in agricultural services every year. A large portion of these subsidies are dis distortionary. For example, 10 African governments spend roughly 1.2 billion annually on input subsidies, primarily on fertilizer subsidies, which is inefficient. We need to shift from distortionary agricultural subsidies to climate smart investment at a much faster rate. Second, governments and their development partners need to combine subsidy reform with efforts to ensure greater adoption of proven climate smart technologies. In places where climate smart agriculture is practiced today, farmers are seeing increased food security and resilience. Both of those areas that I just mentioned, the repurposing of subsidies and increased investment in climate smart agriculture were highlighted by the African leaders at the launch of the Africa Food Security Leadership Dialogue that took place in Kigali in 2019, a process led by African Union, World Bank, and partner UN agencies. The African leaders who gathered in Kigali called for greater investment and actions and adoption of, of, uh, uh, at scale of climate smart agricultural technologies in agriculture, science, and, and agriculture and science, precisely what the ICRA project sets out to achieve. Making this sort of a shift will put Africa food system on a more sustainable footing while ensuring better use of scare public funds. This shift will also perform an important catalytic role because we know from experience that public investment in climate smart agriculture unlocks greater volumes of private finance in uh, climate smart agriculture. By increasing the productivity of agriculture and its resilience in the face of climate change, public investment in climate smart agriculture will help to de-risk private investment in the sector, inducing private sector invest private investors to focus on long-term growth potential. ICRA will contribute to this important agenda, not only by promoting the development, validation, and dissemination of climate smart technologies, but also by working on innovative financing models co-developed with the public and private sector. With these comments, let me conclude and thank you for your attention. Thank you, Simeon, for your opening statement and for reminding us that ICA project is responding directly to the call by the African leaders that was made in 2019 for greater investment and upscaling of climate smart agriculture. At this point, I'd like to invite our next speaker, Bruce Campbell, who is the director for, for the CGIR research program on climate change, agriculture and food security. Bruce, over to you. Thanks, Tembi. Um, so I'm gonna give a brief introduction to the project, Accelerating Impacts of CGIR Climate Research for Africa. We've heard about the challenges from the previous speakers. This one is particularly gonna focus on this food production failures in the face of climate change. This is a recent diagram that the team has put together, looking at drought, flood, temperature, climate, uh, climate variability, and actually it's the combinations of all those things coming together often at this, in the same season. So these are the, this is the challenges that we face. So 
as, as previous speakers have also mentioned, we're building on the uh, African initiatives going back to the Malaba Declaration, which set ambitious tasks, uh, ambitious targets to end hunger. And it actually called for African knowledge institutions and development partners to get behind those ambitions. Simeon has just mentioned the Africa Food Security Leadership Dialogue, where, where, and that also goes back to a point Jürgen made, stressing the importance of policies to get CSA moving and taken up by farmers. So we're building it on, on um, African initiatives. So what's the rationale? Scaling up ambition. There's 60 million Af uh, farmers in Africa. Essentially, if we want to achieve the SDGs, we have to reach them all within the next decade. Strengthening institutional and human capacity and the focus in this project is on innovation capacity, working with national institutions to enhance uh, innovation to achieve this ambition. Generating and, and validating knowledge. This needs the applied research coming together with the basic research. It needs the international research organizations coming together with the national research organizations and working with farmers so that this, this knowledge really is useful on the ground. And making sure these technologies get out. We cannot, as scientists, continue to write papers. We have to make sure that our technologies get into the field. So the objectives of ICRA, strengthen the capacity of targeted partners and stakeholders, enhance access to climate information services and validated climate smart agricultural technologies, and spur innovation and improve capacity to generate, transfer knowledge, to transfer decision-making tools and validated technologies. Uh, Tembi said it wonderfully, if you want to go far, go together. This is a project all about partnerships. So some of our key partners are the National Agricultural Research and Extension Services in the countries where we'll work. Also the National Meteorological Services, so we can really bring climate information services together with the technologies together, as well as uh, the university knowledge partners. We're also working at a regional level. So that means bringing in the agricultural research organizations, dealing with the sub-regions and the climate centers. Our theory of change is that the private sector is absolutely crucial to reach scale. And there's many SMEs that we'll be working for, too many too many that to put on the, uh, their logos on the, this diagram. As well as another key part of the theory of change is making sure one's working with farmers. We also work with the Africa-wide institutions and various development partners to ensure reaching scale. And finally, I put the CGIR logo on, the, on, the, on this diagram. It's one CGIR working across all the centers, multiple centers playing a part in this particular project. The geographic focus is the uh, West Africa and the Sahelian drylands, Eastern Africa, dry lowlands and highlands, and the Southern African drylands. We're focusing on six countries, which uh, indicated on this diagram. But our strategy is really through learning alliances and working with the regional partners to achieve spillovers to other countries within Africa. So I've indicated that we're going to be working at these multiple levels. Uh, and at each level, we have thematic teams, uh, sub-regional leads within countries. We have a lead CGIR center, but it's bringing in multiple CGIR centers. And in all cases, working with multiple partners. The three components of ICRA, the one is about knowledge generation and sharing. And uh, this is about the climate information services and the CSA packages coming together. It's about gender sensitive plans and priorities and many other things which I can't put on this diagram. The second component is getting the partnerships for delivery. So innovative partnerships, engagement platforms. And going back to one of the points one Lucas mentioned, we will be bringing in people from the finance community into the project in order to scale up and bring the finance into the scaling process. And the third part is getting uptake 
getting decision support systems into the national, national advisory systems, getting investment plans happening. The project is based on performance. Uh, we'll be assessing performance. So it's a performance-based project. And there's 12 indicators. I just give you some of the indicators as examples. So for knowledge generation and sharing, it's about uh, what are the new climate knowledge, uh, climate relevant knowledge products? What are the decision making tools that can go that are ready for uptake? It's also about uh, some peer, peer reviewed research papers. Strengthening partnerships for delivery component. It's about establishing or strengthening advisory platforms and advisory hubs. It's about launching or strengthening new partnerships. Uh, and the last component, validating CSA innovations. So one of the indicators is CIS and CSA technologies actually reaching women through customized programs. So we'll be assessing how many of those actually happen amongst our partnership group. Or, and going back to Jürgen's point on policy, what policy and investment decisions have been influenced by the project? Uh, my last few slides, just to give you a little flavor of a bit more detail of the kinds of things, and these are only drop in the ocean examples. So, for example, working on solar powered irrigation in Zambia, the plan is uh, looking at the kinds of pumps available, the value chains that, where it will work, and piloting with farmers. Thinking about inclusive business models and financing solutions with the private sector partners. Uh, how do we get it out there through incubators, accelerator programs, internship programs? And ultimately, having multi-stakeholder scaling dialogues led by farmers and bringing this all together. So that's just one example from Zambia. In Ethiopia, we plan to work with the uh, uh, Ethiopian Digital Agroclimate Advisory Platform, which we've been working with for the past few years and really bringing it to the scale of millions of farmers. So this is better forecasting and getting the content for the advisories and potentially going digital in order to get at least digital to the extension offices, if not the farmers. In uh, Senegal, also bringing C uh, CIS and CSA together, working with multidisciplinary working groups. So this is the example used in Senegal where the ANASIM, which is the meteorological agency, brings together various partners, farmers, uh, rural radios to improve forecasting and to get advisories, the, the kinds of advisories that farmers need. And a, a very specific example of a single product that we aim for. After three years, ICRA hopes to to show the experience and results in promoting women's entry into advancement in agricultural research and extension. For as we know, there's a plenty of equity issues to deal with within the research community itself. Thank you. Uh, we really look forward to this project. And I think the really interesting thing is goes back to Tembi's phrase. If you want to go far, go together. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Bruce, for unpacking this exciting uh, initiative that we are launching today. At this point, I would like us to move on to the next segment of the program where we have a panel discussion. I'd like to hand over to Simeon to moderate the panel discussion for us. Thank you, uh, uh, Tembi. I just want to uh, make sure that uh, we have a uh, all the uh, panelists around. Uh, get uh, the name of uh, everyone. So um, I just want to ensure that uh, we have uh, all our, uh, our panelists uh, around. Um, uh, is Keso around? 
Yes, I am around, okay. uh, Simeon. Just, just to, uh, uh, good. I will just, uh, then I will also, uh, Daniel. Yes, I'm also here. Good afternoon, everyone. Okay. Um, we have uh, Victor Mugo. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening from wherever you're listening from the club. I am here. Okay. All right. And uh, I hope Monday Fu is there. There was some, I understand that there were some issues with uh, this connection. Is Monday Fu Neguse Iran? No. So um, our uh, discussion will be then with uh, uh, Daniel uh, uh, Queso and um, uh, Daniel Queso and Victor. Okay. I would like to uh, uh, thank you each for uh, uh, participating in this uh, 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 panel discussion, which is it's going to be quite uh, interesting. We'll talk about uh, challenges and solutions to accelerate the uh, impact of climate research uh, for Africa. Um, just uh, to, to the audience, I want to indicate that uh, uh, all the panelists have um, their uh, uh, CVs and uh, details uh, in the list. So if you want to know a bit more about uh, uh, each one of them, you can just... Uh, uh, browse through uh, the uh, the uh, the flyers and the descriptions um, of uh, the, of the brief CVs of the participants. But let me uh, we the way we're going to organize this is we have like two rounds of um, of questions and for which we expect uh, the uh, uh, speakers uh, to say uh, to respond uh, briefly. I would like to start uh, basically with um, uh, Keso. Uh, from uh, your experience, uh, what is the main challenge in relation to promoting women's entry and advancement in agricultural research and extension in Africa? Thank you, Simeon. And I'm happy the previous uh, presentation by Bruce highlighted uh, some of the solutions to the challenges that I will uh, highlight. Um, this area is uh, surrounded with a number of challenges, but I will stick to two. The first one has to do with uh, the overall gender equality and women's empowerment policy dynamics in the continent. The design of the policy, the implementation, and the monitoring and evaluation. This is characterized by weak, insufficient and poor architecture of the policy. And the policy environment therefore has a big role uh, inhibiting a strong framework to guide and promote women's entry and advancement. And also the policy environment does to a large extent fail to promote uh, women's capacities in the research, uh, agricultural research. Therefore, there is an, an, issue, an issue of skill gaps, uh, especially for women. Most African countries actually uh, do not have robust STEM policies. And more so, they do not even have STEM policies that promote girls to enroll in the uh, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. And we do know that agricultural research requires solid background in STEM. Therefore, really this becomes a huge challenge. So the policy environment really needs to be gender responsive. The second challenge, and two, two minutes is inefficient, but in a few, um, it's not enough, but I'll try. The second challenge has to do with the, the design of the agri agricultural uh, research. I would like to be corrected, but I doubt that the design is actually gender responsive. 
and it does not also accommodate women's lived experiences and women's indigenous knowledge. And the way the design is made, half the time it is not designed to accommodate the time poverty that uh, women suffers. Does it facilitate a uh, part-time, you know, you know to, to be designed in such a way that probably after hours or for women to participate on a, on a part-time basis. So really the design of the agricultural research needs to be looked into to ensure that the women's perspectives are taken into account and also the reality is that they uh, have a lot of burdens of um, household chores where they are restricted to give it their best. So for me, those are the main challenges. Of course, there are many because really talking about women's uh, challenges in agricultural research and uh, extension in Africa, it's, 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 it's near impossibility. Now, the last one that I want to point out before I, I, before I hand over to you, um, Simeon, is the issue of repackaging of information, information packaging for extension services. Is it packaged in such a way that uh, women access it and half the time it isn't? Usually there is no gender sensitivity in uh, packaging the information. Therefore, women are missed out in the information uh, provision. And let me reiterate by saying that I have seen that the ICRA project has been designed in such a way that issues of access and issues of advancement are going to be uh, looked into. And also to refer back to what Tembi said, let's be inclusive. You want to go fast, you go alone, you want to go far, bring women, especially young women, girls into the picture and prepare them for entry and advancement. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, uh, uh, Keso. Let me uh, briefly remind everyone. Okay, Keso basically is uh, Keso Mat Matashane Marite, I hope I'm having the pronunciation correct, is uh, a gender affairs officer. Yes, you are. Thank you, thank you. Is a gender affairs officer at the Gender Equality and Women's Empowerment Section in the Gender, Poverty and Social Policy Division in uh, uh, ECA. Prior to joining uh, ICA, uh, ECA, sorry, uh, she worked as a national coordinator and chief researcher for women and law in Lesotho. My next uh, uh, question will be uh, to uh, Daniel. And um, uh, briefly, uh, Daniel is uh, the Ghana country manager for ESOCO Networks and is responsible for developing innovative ICT tools and e-extension services using mobile uh, uh, phones. So my question to you, uh, Daniel, are digital tools a solution for accelerating the impact of climate research in Africa? And if so, why? All right. Good afternoon, everybody, and thank you very much for having me on this program. I'll just go straight to the points, and I will say that absolutely it is that digital tools are a major, one of the most important uh, solutions to scale up the impact of climate research across Africa at the lowest cost. Now, you all know that traditional extension has been very, very difficult and expensive to scale to small farmers across Africa. I'm a currently the extension officer to farmer ratio it's estimated that one is to 3,000 farmers, which means that 3,000 farmers can assess only one extension officer. Now, at this rate, it is virtually impossible to accelerate the impact of climate research among farmers who critically need this research funding to plan better and adapt new resilient agricultural technologies. And for me, this is where digital solutions uh, play a vital role and crucial role to bridge the information asymmetry that exists within the agricultural value chain. There have been numerous studies that have been conducted that show the effectiveness of digital tools to connect climate information to the last mile user. These tools may include basic messaging service like SMS, IVR, 
call centers, but also increasingly mobile apps that are able to customize and localize high level climate information into a language and format that an ordinary small farmer can utilize, understand, and be able to apply in their day to day farming operations. Now, you at SOCO have seen that digital tools have led to income increase of over 10% among farmer populations. And many of these farmers have adopted this climate information and been able to do increase their productivity levels. In fact, in some cases, you've seen that this climate information delivered over mobile channels have led to several other unintended positive impacts, like even how the household should plan on what to eat based on climate information that they receive uh, from our services. Now, to kind of to summarize what I've been trying to say, we know that the fourth industrial evolution is marked by massive advances in digital technologies. And this must be leveraged on to the, uh, and be able to scale up uh, climate change impact across Africa, where 70% of the population are engaged in this climate sensitive sector of agriculture. I mean, if you want to uh, deliver climate information via the traditional such delivery, you can be sure that many more farmers will not have access to this information. Many more farmers cannot afford even to pay for private sector uh, uh, extension delivery programs. But if digital tools, farmers can set at the comfort of their farm, even at their farms, and receive a simple messaging either via voice or SMS or even through a call center service and be able to access this information. And for us, we think that any program that is really aimed at accelerating the impact of climate um, uh, change impact needs to adopt and incorporate uh, digital tools for it to be more effective, to, for it to be more cost-effective, efficient, and be able to apply at scale. Uh, thank you very much uh, for that question. Okay. Uh, I'll thank you, Daniel. I'll come to you uh, again in the second round of questions and to ask another one uh, specifically to what you're doing uh, in Ghana. Um, I would like to now go to uh, Victor. Um, I don't know if Mandefro is still... Uh, uh, is connected or not? Uh, if not, I will go to uh, Victor. Uh, Victor Mungo uh, is the country coordinator, uh, Climate Smart Agriculture Youth Network in Kenya, and uh, is um, an innovative and versatile development professional with a refined fin finance in the theme areas of agricultural risk management, sustainable uh, finance, climate smart um, agriculture, youth empowerment through agriculture, as well as communications for development. Moreover, he is a Bolog Adesina Fellow and a 2017 Young African Leaders Initiative Fellow. So um, my question to, uh, uh, my first question to Victor, uh, what are the main challenges that the African youth is facing in relation to participation in research activities for addressing the main impacts of climate change in the agriculture sector? Over to you. Thank you so much, Simon, and thank you so much to the speakers who have gone before me. I do not want to sound repetitive, um, especially from uh, Keso's uh, sentiments uh, on, on gender issues, really, uh, that uh, encompass uh, young women, and especially women, uh, in terms of policy, the uh, policy environment, the design of agricultural research, uh, the structures of support around uh, women, and especially young people uh, while conducting this research, as well as the inform uh, packaging of the information and the delivery tools uh, for, for all of this. Um, and so just to set the scene here, um, uh, although climate change really is a political issue, is an economic issue, is a gender issue, is a development issue, is a global issue, uh, climate change, especially in Africa, is a youth issue. And, and this is why. Uh, so you all know that in uh, most of the African countries where the youth uh, population account for a sizable uh, share of the population, uh, these economies really depend heavily on agriculture. Um, which is also highly predisposed to climate change and, and climate risks. Um, and so by this fact, uh, climate change really ranks among the most important dynamics that is uh, shaping the success and sustainability of efforts uh, really to create decent employment opportunities for young people uh, in this continent. Uh, and also, uh, young people are really vulnerable to climate change. Uh, 
uh, in terms of vulnerability um, that is measured in terms of exposure, sensitivity, and adaptive capacity in all of these dimensions, then rural young people are, are particularly disadvantaged. And if you go a step further, young women are even more disadvantaged. Um, and so today's youth are not only facing uh, uh, suffering the brunt of climate change and the effects of climate change, uh, but they will also bear the cost of the failure for us to address these risks uh, and the effects uh, throughout uh, their lifetimes. Um, but I do not want to look at young people really as the, uh, as the challenge here. I want to look at young people as the solution. And so there are numerous examples across uh, the, the continent of young people who are implementing research, who are undertaking uh, action really, uh, that is transforming the way we produce, uh, the way we add value, the way we store, uh, the way we consume, the way we sell our food, uh, even in the context of the changing climate. Um, and so if there's a thing also that we've learned about, especially African youth and the global youth, uh, is that the youth are passionate about their futures, uh, they are passionate about climate change, and they are passionate about climate um, uh, uh, sustainability. And so um, as we think about accelerating the impact uh, of CGR climate uh, research in Africa, it is also important to think about how we can be able to accelerate and deepen research, uh, especially on young people. Uh, what we've seen uh, across uh, the continent is that uh, the young people's contribution towards climate research and also uh, towards uh, and the effects uh, to young people really is obscured uh, by the lack of data. Um, and so the intersectionality of all these factors that uh, encompass youth, uh, including uh, agriculture, climate change, migration, gender, uh, conflict, all these things are quite important to understand and with um, evidence based, then we can be able to co-create solutions with the youth uh, in, um, uh, in, in the heart. Um, and so I also think that it's important to deepen investments uh, that address and build the capacity of rural youth on climate change. And so um, these investments really that are targeting young people should need to address the aspect of climate change, but also the investments that target climate action uh, should actively involve the youth. Um, and lastly, I also think that it's important for us to deepen and accelerate partnerships with the youth uh, that lead to meaningful youth engagement. Uh, so we cannot think about sustainability um, uh, and even climate research without thinking about the youth. And we cannot think about scaling uh, climate research without involving the group that has the most and, and the demographic dominance. And that and so I think it's really important that we can have the youth in the question. We can have youth meaningfully engaged uh, so that we can be able to scale and accelerate uh, the impact of climate research. Okay. Um, thank you um, uh, very much, uh, Victor, for uh, those clarifying points. Um, bear with me, I have um, a second round of questions uh, for each uh, one of you. And um, I'd love to go back uh, uh, to Keso. Uh, so Keso, um, from uh, your perspective, how can ICRA address the following two challenges? Uh, women are not accessing uh, CSA technologies to the same extent as men. And Two, women are less represented in agricultural research and advanced at a lower rate than men. How would you oh, give us your perspective on that? Thanks. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Simeon. That is very, very true that uh, women are not accessing CSA information and technologies to the same extent as men. And really for us to move forward and to provide solutions. We do need to look closely and in depth at the normative understanding of gender relations. We, we, we need to really pay uh, attention to the, to the gender relations and gender inequalities to open our eyes and really open our eyes widely to the inequalities that are inherent uh, in this uh, area. As I said earlier, uh, and as it has already been alluded to, CSA technologies are not necessarily designed 
to be empowering. By default, probably not, because anti-poverty is the big overburdened with household chores that are never acknowledging information to the same level. If boys and girls are, are, are not um, carrying out the same chores, household chores, therefore the boys or the young men are more likely to be getting more advantaged while uh, women get their uh, contribution to agriculture. They are more likely to be carrying out activities that are labor intensive. And this in itself also limits uh, them to access uh, the technologies and information that was in uh, constraints. Uh, because women are more likely to, uh, you know, to, to have limited access to credit and other resources. And as their male counterparts, there are a number of reasons why countries in Africa, it has to do uh, with their minority legal status. And also they do uh, for men, really. I'm not so sure whether it is deliberate, but uh, unfortunately, this is the reality. Uh, in the in the continent that the experiences of how but going back also to the whole policies that are meant to actually push women and girls this continent has majority um majority uh, takes into account the lived experiences of women and take into account the silent killers that we usually are not opening our eyes to we assume we are starting from the same um the same grounds the 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 the, the, the policy environment does not have the you know the, the level are obvious but a lot of them are hidden but the one that i want to um Africa as normal for women and girls to be uh, carrying the burden of the household chores and also undertaking agricultural uh, tasks that are labor intensive. And that actually does lead to other uh, challenges that may be difficult to deal with. So let us strengthen the policy environment, not only to design good policies, let, let's be sure that there is implementation of policies and also there are incentives for implementation of policies and to regularly monitor and, and, and uh, evaluate whether those Did we lose uh, Keso? Okay, um, until uh, she comes back, I would like to go to uh, uh, Danielle. Um, Danielle, I um, asked you a question earlier uh, about uh, whether or not uh, uh, digital tools were a solution for accelerating the impact of climate change in Africa. And of course, you responded uh, without hesitation, yes, with some um, good examples. Now, I'd like to ask you, uh, from your experience working in uh, Esoko, what are the main cha challenges to, to, from your perspective, what are the main challenges to accelerate the impact of climate research in Africa? Did I lose it? Yes, I lost to a bit. Uh, I'm not sure if you, you can if you can recap the question once again. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, I'm sorry. Daniel. I'm sorry. Okay, I thought the problem was on my side, so I, I began to worry. <laughs> um, I was just saying that uh, I asked you a question um, earlier, uh, where uh, if the digital uh, tools. Uh, were a solution for accelerating the impact of climate research in Africa. And uh, you responded without uh, hesitation, yes, and you explain why with some examples. 
So I want to come back to you uh, and and ask from your experience, um, from your experience working in the SOCO, what do you see as the main challenges to accelerate the impact of climate research in Africa? All right, thank you very much. I hope we have a stable connection this time. So essentially from what you've seen, uh, the main challenge has been difficulty in getting the results from the climate research to the people who really need it most at a community level. I mean, many research programs are designed without building into the program design mechanism to disseminate the research findings, especially to pharma groups who need this information very, very importantly. Also, some of these research are done without the adequate institutional and local partnerships, as well as private engagement that are critically required to ensure sustainable downstream dissemination and utilization of climate um, and, uh, research findings. Now, the end result has been that we have a lot of information out there available at the international research article, but then when you go to the community level, people don't know what has been done. People do very, very little actually exist. And so you go to the, we can just do a simple Google search and then you find several uh, interesting articles and research findings or climate related information. But at the community level where this information needs to be utilized and, and adopted, very little really do exist in this, in this area. Now, this information asymmetry between communities Pharma groups and international climate research must be bridged as a matter of agency to assess the impact of climate research in Africa. The second challenge has also been the willingness and ability to pay for this climate information by all actors like culture value chain. Now, everyone, everybody wants information, but nobody really wants to pay for information. Every those of us on this program now, if you go to any website looking for any information and you ask to pay, let's say five dollars, you are more likely going to switch to a place where you can get it for free. Now, you can't expect anything more than this from a small farmer who already struggles uh, to buy inputs for their farming activities. Uh, so there are going to be some mechanisms in place that allow, that allow these people to be able to have access to this information without having necessarily uh, to kind of spend a lot of money, a lot of resources to access this information. Now, the other challenge that we have seen is also that most of these publicly funded programs do not have inbuilt sustainability models. And uh, so the program ends when the donor funding also ends. And so at the same time, you have a lot of interesting articles that are out that people can actually use. But because the product finding this research has ended, nobody is there actually to kind of take on this, uh, this research um, findings and take them to the community level. And I will think that these issues must be addressed if you really want to scale up uh, climate impact research in, 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 the, in the African rural communities. We believe that public private partnerships really need to be a key part in any program design so in such a way that even when the main program funding ends, there's be somebody who, who is there to continue providing service to these rural people who need information very, very urgently. So these are the things th that you've seen that's really a hampering uh, the acceleration of climate change impact um, research in Africa. Well, let me try to recap. One is institutional partnership, local partnerships, uh, information asymmetry that exists within a cultural value chain, but then also lack of sustainability models that have been built into these programs and then people's willingness and inability to pay uh, for these information programs uh, that have been designed essentially to help them to adopt to climate uh, change impact. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Daniel. We are uh, <clears throat> reaching the end of uh, this particular session before uh, going to the uh, overall Q&A uh, from the uh, audience because we do have uh, several questions coming from uh, um, the meeting uh, participants. So my last question to you uh, is uh, to uh, Victor. Uh, how can um, ICRA work better with youth groups in Africa to accelerate the impacts of climate research? Uh, thank, thank you so much, Simon, for, for that. Um, and, and to do this, let me just exemplify what um, a, a, just a small collaboration with uh, a CGR center really has been able to do uh, so far. So as the Climate Smart Agriculture Youth Network, we are a network of young people who are engaged in climate smart agriculture. Our work really is to help young, young people transition into farming, but not just into farming or on-farm production, into climate smart agriculture. Um, and so uh, through our partnership with the Alliance of Biodiversity International and, 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 and CIET, um, in which we were um, uh, incorporated together with them uh, a few years ago, um, we started thinking, of, we started seeing some research really that could help young people uh, to, to transform what they were doing and, and transform their livelihoods. Um, so the first thing that we saw 
uh, was the climate smart uh, uh, villages that uh, have been piloted by CCAPS. And so what we did was to customize that solution to a young people's solution. Um, and so we created CSA Excellence Centers, which are demonstration farms that are run by young people um, that are then through this, then it's an opportunity for young people to come and learn more about climate smart agriculture, uh, seeing other young people that are implementing climate smart agriculture and being uh, very good at it and uh, seeing the improvements in productivity as well as in resilience, then other young people can be able to adopt this. Uh, and we also see that um, the climate smart excellence centers have been an opportunity for even young people to get an extra income by training other uh, rural uh, smallholder farmers uh, in that. Um, we also saw the opportunity for uh, that was uh, uh, there by the high ion beans uh, that was released by the Pan-African Bean Research Alliance. Um, and so we took this and we started piloting high, bean, uh, uh, high ion bean uh, um, uh, by growing them. Uh, and we've done quite a number of of um, pilots and, and we've seen this really being taken up by young people but also fetching very good prices for young people because they are uh, quite a niche product uh, but as well they really help to improve the nutrition uh, for um, especially young women and, and ladies who are in the adolescent age uh, and so we've seen really uh, partnerships with the Alliance for uh, um, the Alliance of Biodiversity International and and, and CIAT, uh, together with uh, the Climate Smart Agriculture Youth Network, really yielding results. And, and what I think uh, is that this is not just a solitary case. Uh, this is not. Um, uh, we, we are not just an, uh, an, a program in, in isolation, that partnerships with young people really can be able to uh, help uh, to, to scale uh, climate research uh, in, 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 in Africa. Uh, and to see how this can be even be better improved, I, I would uh, look at the changing uh, face of youth engagement. Uh, and so uh, this notes that uh, uh, youth representation is only the first stage. Uh, the next thing is active involvement and meaningful participation. Um, that the youth do not just want to sit at the table, they want to share also the share of the cake that is being shared uh, on, the, uh, on the table. Um, that the youth do not just have ideas, they have investable propositions. They are concretizing these ideas into investable propositions. Um, and the youth do not want to be lumped up in categorical jargon. So sometimes, um, and this has happened, that the youth are, uh, are mentioned, women, youth, and people with disabilities. And this then limits the impact and also the evidence for which young people are, are transforming food uh, systems, but also are uh, engaging in climate research. Uh, and so I, I tend to think that ICRA has already started doing this by meaningfully participating uh, young people, having representatives of, of young people um, in, in, in some of their clusters. Uh, and I think this is the kind of a new change, the changing face of youth engagement that is required really uh, to scale climate uh, research in Africa. Uh, uh, thank you, uh, uh, Victor. Let me, <clears throat> now it is the time, I want to really um, 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 open uh, the discussion to uh, the broader audience. I've received uh, uh, several questions I would like uh, to ask uh, uh, the panelists, but also the previous uh, uh, speakers like Bruce uh, as well, and uh, possibly uh, also Tembi, by the way, a question for you. So um, one question, uh, that I have from the audience is uh, ICRA uh, will promote the use of digital platforms and the use of information by uh, farmers. But how would ICRA address digital literacy and inclusion? Uh, this question, uh, I would like to address it to uh, Daniel and Bruce. Thanks. All right, thank you, um, Simon, for the question. So essentially, uh, literacy, you all know, is very high in Africa, but digital literacy is actually much higher across Africa. Uh, what we have done to kind of bypass the issue of literacy is that instead of providing some of the digital information via SMS-based services, we have gone to the extent of doing them via voice messaging in local languages. And so for instance, in Ghana, you're covering 15 local mm -hmm. languages where farmers are able to get access to this information in their own local languages. I mean, this issue kind of clearly solved the issue of the illiteracy uh, among farmers in, in Africa. And so we, we intend to actually continue this engagement in this in the ICAR project also, 
where all the information that will be generated by the various partners will be digitized, customized, and localized in a format that the farmers can read and understand. And they'll be given to them via um, digital, uh, via um, uh, voice uh, messaging platforms. This way, there's no issue of literature. I'm able to read, I'm not able to read. You get a message or the content in your own local language. There will be a course under support where you can. Um, I think uh, we have a digital much more information and much more clarification what you are receiving in the service and the technology that is going out uh, to these people. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Daniel. <clears throat> we have a bit of uh, you know uh, challenges on the uh, the you know the, the hearing you because sometimes you know you get frozen. But all this could to go to show that we would uh, sustain investment on infrastructure for uh, the internet system. All what we're talking about, uh, you know, the climate system may mm -hmm. not go far. So in terms of policies and, and investment, I think uh, it will be good. That's what we talk about, repurposing in some of these uh, uh, expenditures to focus on public goods like, such as uh, development of, uh, of the internet system, the infrastructure needed to support uh, exactly what we are talking about. Um, so let me uh, go to um, uh, another. Bruce, do you like any, do you like to add? Um, I, I don't think I don't think I have much to add. So I mean, Daniel did a great job of answering the question. I, I just uh, perhaps I'd uh, following up on what Victor was saying is actually in literacy we do expect to work with a lot of young people as well because often the literacy with the younger generation. Is, uh, is better than with the older generation. So that will be another link with the, the, with, with the youth work that we imagine. Okay. Thanks. <clears throat> there, there are a few questions for, for you also, Bruce, sometime. So I'll, I'll call on you again, uh, uh, even in the current one, to, 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 to you and, and Keso. So um, both you know, Keso and Bruce uh, discussed how access and equity continue to be an issue. How would ICRA address these issues? Are there examples? Okay, so you'd like to come in and then Bruce will come in. You know, it's easier to pose challenges than to come up with the solutions. For me, I think the first step is to address the skills gap in the knowledge gaps and capacity. I think building capacity is very important, but while you, 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 you bring in the issue of building capacity, be sensitive to the realities that affect uh, the people who are targeted and ensure that your programs are designed in such a way that they target women. When you want women to to access and also advance, ensure that you, you design the programs in such a way that you attract them and be sensitive to the challenges that we have posed, that they do not have the time. Uh, I hope ICRA will consider uh, introducing flexi time when you are uh, designing your programs. Ensure that uh, you target women at times that they will be able to give you their all. So in other words, if you are, you want them to really enter the space, provide uh, the skills and address the, the capacity, uh, the capacity gaps, but while doing so, do so mindful of the, the um, uneven terrain that they're operating from, that they may not have the power the decision making, and you may have to negotiate uh, their participation in the research and in the climate smart uh, agriculture. Thank you. Thank you. I, I think we have many more questions, but um, due to uh, the time, I would like to really stop here uh, so that we can move to the next segment of the uh, uh, event. But let me see this opportunity to really thank uh, all the panelists, uh, Keso, uh, Danielle, uh, and uh, Victor for uh, really uh, making, uh, answering uh, uh, 
uh, difficult questions, but also providing uh, the kind of uh, answers that people are looking for. So um, the other questions uh, have been recorded and some of them may be sent to you and feel free to respond to them uh, as you can, either in writing or whatever. But uh, I want to really thank you for uh, uh, being available and uh, to discuss this important uh, topic. Let me stop here and hand over to the MC for the next segment of the event. Demi. Thank you, Simeon. And thank you to the panelists for um, highlighting the issues that indeed ICAO is going to be addressing. At this point, we'll now move on to the signing ceremony. For Africa, ICA grant between the CGIAR represented by Juan Lucas Restrepo, who is the Director General of the Alliance of Biodiversity and CIED, and the World Bank represented by Simeon Ewi, who is the Regional Director for Sustainable Development for Africa. In view of the COVID-19 pandemic, the CGIR and the World Bank have agreed to hold the signing ceremony virtually, where the agreement will be signed simultaneously in two locations, in Rome, Italy, and in Washington, DC, USA. I would like to invite Juan Lucas Restrepo to deliver a short remark for this occasion. Thanks again, uh, Tembi. Uh, this is very exciting. I also, uh, Simeon, enjoyed listening to the panelists uh, on how it's not climate uh, smart solutions, but gender youth participatory work capacity development uh, to make sure we have the full recipe uh, and are uh, absolutely successful. This initiative uh, marks an important milestone in CGIR and its partners' efforts to fight climate change and build nature positive food, land and water systems. This effort is at the core of our new CGI, One CGIR Research and Innovation Strategy, which will drive our work towards 2030. While the strategy includes a specific impact area around climate adaptation and mitigation, this project will also contribute to the rest of the areas, especially nutrition, health and food security, as well as poverty reduction, livelihoods and jobs. Through this project, we hope to equip farmers and livestock keepers with the tools needed to better anticipate climate related events and take preventive actions to preserve their livelihoods. We hope that by providing farmers with better access to climate advisories and information about effective response measures, we will help communities better safeguard their livelihoods and the environment. We're thankful, thankful to the World Bank for its contribution to this project, and we look forward to working together for the success of this initiative. Over to you, Tembi. Thank you, Juan Lucas, for those remarks. And now I'd like to invite Simon Ewi to give us his remarks. <clears throat> Thank you, Tembi. Uh, it's a, for me, it's a real pleasure uh, to represent the World Bank uh, Regional IDA program and also uh, the Regional Integration Director, uh, D.B. Uh, Wetzel. Uh, during the signing ceremony <clears throat> for the accelerating impact of CGIAR climate research in Africa project. So the, this project is a significant initiative that will help leverage cutting edge CGIAR led science to catalyze the uptake of climate smart agriculture and promote food security in the context of climate change in Africa. The countries that finance the IDA, the International Development Association, and the governors who represent them are pleased to see this innovative use 
of IDA resources in support of CJAR and its partners throughout Africa. Public investments in science and innovation will be invaluable in helping governments throughout the region deliver solutions to help Africa's farmers. It will help agriculturalists address the enormous challenges that they face and enable the emergence of the more productive, resilient, and sustainable food system to which we all aspire. Strong partnerships between CGIA, regional and national African organizations, universities on the continent and beyond, the NGOs, private firms, and the international development agencies will be key to transform Africa's food systems and making them productive, resilient, and sustainable. The World Bank is committed to continuing its long-standing support for this important agenda, as reflected in the IDA grant agreement we are signing today. Over to you. Thank you, Simeon, for those uh, remarks. At this point, I would like to invite both Juan Lucas and Simeon to simultaneously sign the agreement in order to formalize the IICA project. <laughs> okay. Thank you. We shall now proceed with a virtual photo shoot to commence the ceremony, commemorate the ceremony. Thank you. If you can both just hold up the signed documents for the photo. From the bottom, okay, all right. You see it well? Yeah. <laughs> Looking good. Thank you, Juan Lucas and Simeon Ewi. And now we'll display a short video to conclude the ceremony. And for our last speaker, I would like to invite Claudia Sado, the, ex the Executive Management Team Convener and Managing Director, Research, Delivery and Impact at the CGIR to deliver the closing remarks. Thank you so much, Tembi. It's been really exciting to hear so many voices, perspectives and ideas here today on how we can deliver a climate smart future for Africa one that's driven by science and innovation and anchored in agricultural systems. The African continent is seeing the fastest population growth of any region in the world. It's also on the front lines of climate change, warming faster than all other regions. These interrelated challenges of climate change and food security are most urgent in Africa. Support for climate smart food systems must be an integral part of our efforts to bolster African livelihoods as we build back from the COVID-19 pandemic. So new initiatives like ICRA are timely and prescient. 
ICRO will significantly enhance access to climate information services and climate smart agricultural technologies in African countries that receive IDA support, support from the International Development Association of the World Bank. For 50 years, CGIR and our partners have delivered critical science and innovation that has helped feed the world and combat inequality. And as the Managing Director for Research and Impact at CGIR, I'm absolutely delighted to be part of today's launch. ICRA will accelerate the impact of this climate research in Africa for Africa. Initiatives like ICRA are foundational to the CGIR research strategy, research and innovation strategy to 2030, which upgrades our global research partnerships for an ever-changing world and demands nothing less than a transformation of global food systems in a climate crisis. As we heard from Bruce Campbell, ICRA will generate new knowledge and tools designed to address critical gaps in the design and provision of much needed agricultural climate services. It will enable climate informed investment planning and help design policies that encourage the uptake of climate smart agricultural practices at the regional, sub-regional, and national levels in Africa. ICRA's clear strategic and operational principles will scale its impact, both through the clear definition of the problems that we seek to address and the theory of change that runs all the way from research investment through to development outcomes. I'm also thrilled that ICRA will put end users, farmers and consumers, women, men, and youth, at the heart of the process to generate new ideas. ICRA will connect innovations to their demands as a catalyst for sustainable growth. Clearly, strong partnerships are key to ICRA's success. ICRA builds on a decade of learning in the CGIR research program on climate change, agriculture, and food security that are known as CCAS, where innovations, policy, success were all founded upon collaborations with thousands of stakeholders. Because in delivering transformation, we have seen that partnerships can be just as important as science. And when it comes to funding transformation, simply setting a common agenda between governments, the private sector, as we've heard here today, farmers organizations, multilateral organizations, and investors, all, are all, all part of the change makers in food system, this common agenda is what's needed. And so ICRA will help to set a common agenda. And while ICRA will develop effective multi-stakeholder processes, it will do so while retaining a sharp focus on evidence and results, which will frankly save our partners and stakeholders from being drowned in the processes themselves. This sharp focus on evidence and results will also help CGIR lead from behind where that is needed, opening up opportunities to sometimes more junior partners and to new allies who can leverage the impact of research and innovation. So in closing, I really would like to take this opportunity on behalf of the CGIR executive management team to say to our partners in Senegal, Ghana, Mali, Ethiopia, Kenya, and Zambia, the six countries where ICRA will initially focus its activities, that we are very excited to be working with you on this important and exciting new initiative. And I'd also like to thank our partners and colleagues at the World Bank for continuing to invest in CGIR and providing the support that makes initiatives like ICRA a reality. The relationship between CGIR and the World Bank is one that goes back to the very foundations of CGIR 50 years ago, when the Pearson Report, commissioned by then President McNamara, called for an elevated global effort for development assistance. As today's event testifies, our partnership remains as vibrant, as relevant, and as durable as ever. CGIR's 50th anniversary celebrations this year our reminder of the exciting innovations and tremendous achievements CGIR has delivered, like those we have seen with CCAFs and those we are working toward with ICRA. These have been delivered in partnership with food system champions like many of you in today's virtual event. 
In CGIR's 50th year, however, we are firmly focused forward. We are in the process of transforming ourselves into one CGIR, which will be more fully integrated and we believe more agile, more impactful, and more influential with our science. ICRA and the other one CGIR initiatives and platforms now being developed to deliver on our new 2030 research and innovation strategy make a very promising start to the next 50 years. Let us not delay in delivering on the promise of research and innovation to improve the lives and livelihoods of the poor. Thank you all. Stay well and take care. Thank you, Tembi. Thank you, Claudia, for the closing remarks and for the charge that you have given um, ICRA and all the partners that will be involved. At this point, we have come to the end of our program for today. I'd like to thank all the speakers and all the partners that have been involved in this event for the time and also for sharing the knowledge as well. I'd also like to thank all our participants that have joined using all the different media platforms that we had streaming this meeting. I would also like to invite you to join us again tomorrow and on Wednesday and on Thursday. As I mentioned, this is a four day event. Uh, tomorrow we'll be getting into the dialogues, discussing some of the key issues that the ICA program will be looking at. From me, thank you very much and have a good day further. Thank you, goodbye.